the successes, the achievements, the dominance, the hegemony of the Euro Anglo American world in the past three, four centuries has not come without genocidal aggression. So they have not learned any way of excellence. They don't have a record. They don't have a history to return to, to be dominant, to be on top of the world besides the genocidal um, um, aggression which was handed over by the British Empire to the current American Empire. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to my friend and colleague, Agogo Akpome, who was here in Kyoto just a few weeks ago to join the Neutrality Studies Conference. Hailing originally from Nigeria, Dr. Akpome obtained his PhD in English Literary Studies from the University of Johannesburg, and he is now a lecturer at the University of Zululand in South Africa. Among other topics, Dr. Akpome closely studies the nexus between narratives, colonialism, and identity. So today we want to talk a bit about Africa and global, the global struggle over narratives. Agogo, it's great seeing you again. Thanks for coming online. Thank you so much, Pascal. And thanks for that wonderful conference and the time in Kyoto. I'm very glad you enjoyed it. I'm very glad you came because you gave us a wonderful presentation. Um, your profile doing literary studies is not exactly in the in in international relations, but you 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 came because you looked at you look a lot at how how people tell the stories of international relations and how that shapes their approach. And I'm very very interested in this because Africa, of course, has been on the receiving end for like centuries now, not only of violence, but also of very mean ways of, of justifying that violence. Um, you gave the example of Joseph Borrell. Maybe can you, can you, can you recount a little bit the, the trajectory of this colonial mindset that uh, toward Africa? Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes. You say Africa has been at the receiving end of violence. Yes, so it's um, it's physical violence. It's it's massacres. It's genocides, um, and we could provide a very long list. Uh, but suffice it to say, well, for those who want, people these days are very keen about empirical ev evidence, and maybe we need to remind them of the genocide of the Namas and the Hereros in what was Southwest um, Africa, now Namibia. Um, not very far from where I was born in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, we heard of the Benin massacre of the 1890s. So there's several massacres that have accompanied um, European colonialism, what we call, uh, what I call historical European colonial colonialism. Uh, but then there's also the violence of the narrative. So there is a strong link between what the narratives do to people what you say about people, what is said about people, and what is um, done physically. Uh, the narratives, they usually provide the justification for the decision to, to, to uh, brutalize people. They also provide the justification for brutalities that have been done and that are being done. So there's a very strong link between narratives and acts of aggression especially in the context, not just in the context of colonialism, historical and ongoing, um, um, decolonial scholars today will call it coloniality, uh, but there is a strong link between the, 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 the mindset, the actions, and the actions that are done after the fact to justify or to continue or to sustain to sustain um, um, this violence. So it's, it's both a physical violence and a cultural violence, and a, a men mental violence, a psychological violence, a psycho violence. It's a it's a very serious form of ongoing violence. Yes, I mean the we are seeing this basically live right now in Gaza. 
right? These incredible, insane levels of physical violence of an extermination campaign against a basically defenseless uh, population that goes hand in hand with the narrative that the perpetrator state is defending itself uh, by e eradicating this this victimized population. And this yeah. is a very, very old trope, isn't it? I mean, for yeah. Africans, this 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 is very easy to recognize. Can you maybe speak to that a bit? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, for instance, the entire colonization of the African continent, which, which has gone on for decades, uh, centuries, which continues today, I, th I think it's important to repeat that this continues today. Um, to make the links that you, you speak about, we, we can remember, some people have not looked at this, but it's actually in the public domain, it's online. If you look for the communique issued at the end of the Berlin Conference, the infamous Berlin Conference, 1894 to 19. Five um, part of Article Six of that of that communique, still online, free available today, says that the colonizing states seek to improve the conditions of the morality of the African people. So there is that narrative. That's part of what has been called the idea of a civilization of a civilizing mission of colonialism, the mass murder of a people the grand theft of their resources, the primitive and, and, and very brutal, bestial dehumanization of the people is accompanied by that narrative, is preceded by and sustained by the narrative that this is a civilizing mission. So that is what we find in many parts of the world, as well as in, 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 in Gaza, as we speak today, is the idea that... Um, what is being done is necessary to produce a, an imagined idea of civilization, that it's a necessary civilizing act. Um, it's, um, it's horrendous, to say the least. And how, um, you know, the, the, one of the things that makes me so mad is that on the one hand, uh, the, a lot of, especially Europeans, they think of colonialism more or less in the way that they think of feudalism. It's something that happened eons ago. We know it was part of yeah. our history, but it's it's long, long in the past and we understand yeah. it wasn't good. We understand it caused many societal problems, but we've overcome this. We are now in a, in a, in a world that works differently and everybody is fair to everyone. So everybody gets their fair share and no, we, you know, no reason to think about that anymore. Um, this is this is not what it is, is it? And then, sorry, and I need to combine that then with like remarks like Joseph Borrell talking about the jungle oh, yeah. outside yeah. Of, of Europe. And <laughs> okay. these strains, they go hand in hand, the belief that it's mm. over and the continuation of it. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's interesting. So let's let's maybe let's talk about Borrell a bit. <laughs> um, and it is how Borrell, for me, signifies the continuing, I like the point that you make, the continuation of that same mindset today. He made those comments in June, uh, I think in June of 2022, he made them in 22, definitely. And, you know, in that conference, I raised it and one, I raised another thing he said, and one colleague said, oh no, Borrell isn't the, the most, I think I can't get, can't recall his exact words, but he was suggesting that Borrell isn't the typical um, European leader. But surprise, surprise, he wasn't queried by his bosses, by his employee, em employers. He wasn't, he wasn't countered. Nobody said, no, that's not Europe. I mean, amongst those who made him the senior um, uh, a diplomat, uh, that's a diplomat speaking. So you can imagine when someone who is not a diplomat is speaking behind closed doors about the world. That's the vision Sadly, the reality we have is this monochromatic, monochromatic us versus them, this binary logic remains in the Euro-American political establishment. And it, it usually gladdens our hearts, especially as Africans, when we see other um, colleagues, people like you and the others, very many colleagues doing work, especially during this period of, of the multipolar, uh, multipolar evolution and the wars, uh, and when we see colleagues who 
have a definitely different uh, perspective. It, it really gladdens the heart. Now, to talk about the quantum, the, the, the fact that this continues, that we are not talking about something that is past, I'd like to say two things. One, the narrative that is past is part of the violence. So if, if we are to compare this, for instance, with a in a personal situation, right? Um, let's take a classic case of, you know, a couple and an abusive partner. Uh, and the, the partner abuses, the, the one partner abuses the other and pretends to have changed and wants the relationship to carry on. And the abuse that was done yesterday, this partner today says it's in the past. And then they go on to repeat the abuse in the evening. And, and by the way, the past, let's not forget that the past is also many times a product of narrative. It's also a, a constructed category. Because what many societies, especially those who control narratives in societies, what they admit into the category of past is that which they seek to create a distance from in terms of the way that is used to understand ongoing realities. It's not necessarily what has stopped happening, but it's, what, it's how they want to confine it. They want to confine it to a category that keeps it away from people's ways of processing current and future uh, uh, um, realities. So it's important for the, for the, for the masters of the Euro-American um, 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 uh, political establishment to describe colonialism as past. It's necessary because it masks ongoing acts of colonialism. And it also does that massive job of gaslighting, saying, oh no, what's happening to you today? It's not our fault anymore. So whatever is happening to you is your own fault. One more thing that's important to, to, to drive on this point. Last week, it's uh, the 15th today, so this, this must be last week. Emmanuel Macron was also public, talking about the world is full of herbivores and carnivores. So you see this repeat of an us versus them. And look at his choice of terminology, herbivores and carnivores. Look at the psychology of warfare. And then he's saying Europe needs to be omnivores. He brings in this third category, but it's still a category of conflict. It's still a category of aggression, of violence. It's still a zero sum thinking. So the idea of the omnivore is to devour, is to consume, is to destroy, is to eliminate, is to annihilate the herbivores and the carnivores. So this is a very, if, if we are to make progress, my sense is that if people like you, for instance, who argue for neutrality, which is a very noble argument, which I think um, um, sane and civilized humans ought to, the mindset we ought to have as sane and civilized humans, if we do not deal with this mindset, if we, not, if we do not deal with this vision, then I don't think we are going anywhere. That's I, why I think these are very important, yes. I, I completely agree. It's just, it's, it's, it's kind of shocking to see then how this cognitive dissonance seems to be working inside these people. Because on the one hand, um, and also how it works within the narrative, because in the one hand, the, the narrative portrays itself as the mission civilisatrice, right? As the French call call it, the civilizing mission of yeah. Europe, right? That was this horrible, horrible way of that they that they put that during real yeah. like during colonialism in the 19th century. Um, yeah. On the other hand, they then commit these gross acts of utter inhumanity, right? Mm -hmm. um, as we are seeing right now with the with the the the, the way that the native population of, of of Palestine is being exterminated, right? Yeah. So um and it needs to live at the same at the same time, right? It goes on yeah. hand in hand. Um how yeah. do you explain that the narrative is is able to do that, to proclaim the opposite of what is actually happening? Do you have an explanation hmm. to yourself for that? Yeah, yeah. You know, narratives fascinate me. Uh, especially narratives uh, that create sameness and, dis and difference. Narratives, even in terms of temporality, the narrative with which we construct something to be past. 
For instance, one area of interest for me is, is, is South Africa, obviously. You know, I look at the term post-apartheid and you look at the term post-colonial. I, I used to be post-colonial, but these days I'd rather describe myself in decolonial terms. Uh, because although when it, several years ago, I think in the early 90s already, uh, Anne Manclito came up with the idea to say, when we speak of the post-colonial, we're not using post as a temporal marker to indicate a movement away from colonial. Um, but but then the, the term still burdens, it still gives a misleading impression of what post-colonialism is. Narratives, I think humans are adept. Humans have shown themselves to be excellent in constructing narratives to put space between reality and fantasy, or to put space to put to to to, to construct a non-existent distance between one category and the other. In the terms of identity, that the categories could be the categories of race. Yeah. Uh, it could be the categories of ethnicity. And it is the same skills, often, is the same skills that are deployed, the same narrative, representational, discursive skills that are employed to create sameness, for instance, we could construct sameness between I and you, Pascal. We are men, for instance, right? We can foreground that. We can foreground the fact that we are academics, right? We can foreground the kinds of work, the kind of work we do, we are intellectuals, right? We can also use narrative to construct distance. We could say that we are from different races. We could say we are from different uh, 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 geographical places of origin. So, especially politicians, Politicians, um, religious leaders, even intellectuals like us, academics, teachers, are adept in putting together a certain set of representational terminologies, of representational tropes to create, especially when now they have state support, when they have political support and cultural support, to create and bring which a differences that are not into being Actually, they bring them into being. And sameness, if, if you know the work of Benedict Anderson, who speaks of the imagined community, I don't know if you've read about, is the American scholar. He, he gives a brilliant um, um, theorization of how, how do you, you are Swiss, for instance. How do you come about being Swiss? I'm Nigerian. Nigeria has um, about 900,000 square kilometers. So there are very many Nigerians I will never see, I will never interact with, right? But I take them to be same with me because of the construction of the idea of Nigeria and the idea of Nigerianness. So that construction is extremely powerful for people's psychosocial behavior. And the ability to do that, people's inability to pay attention to what is going on, especially during, during political campaigns, is a very sad thing that people cannot understand when, 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 when public leaders or those who are presenting themselves for public leadership are deploying tropes, are choosing to describe certain categories, are coming up with categories. First, they put the tropes together. They select the appropriate language for their appropriate audience at the appropriate time. Then they come up with categories. So for instance, in previously in South Africa, the racist, the apartheid government came up with category of white, black, colored. Um, Indian. Interestingly, it's 2024, 30 years after 1994, and people still accept the category of colored. Some people actually jealously protect their identities as colored, even though it's only in South Africa that that description is used for what it signifies. So I think we really need to pay, pay close attention. In, in terms of IR that you are saying, this categories are necessary to lodge in the mind of listeners, to lodge in the mind of people that aggression is required. Mm. So in Rwanda, for instance, so you look at you look at the tropes that are used, you look at the categories that, that are used. In Rwanda, for instance, in the lead up to the 1994 genocide, which killed at least 800,000 people in three months, three months flat and in the most brutal of ways but we're not talking about leopold of of belgium who killed 
reportedly killed 10 million in the Congo, for instance. Mm -hmm. In Rwanda, for a close to home example, the Tutsis that we are targeted for elimination, we are described as cockroaches. So you see that term is, is important. A cockroach is a pest to be eliminated. It dehumanizes the target and reduces the target to something that is not human, to something that the aggressor can deploy his powers against to eliminate. And it is the same thing that, that is happening today. It's the same thing when you look at the, the narratives in the Middle East, but I'm very, very, more, very, very interested in Africa. The narratives are around about Africa, Africa and Africans as a place and a people without philosophy, a people, um, and the, the latest one that's taken my interest is uh, the narratives around corruption. So you hear a lot of these narratives, well, Africans are corrupt, the states are corrupt. This is to justify the dehumanizing ethos of the colonial mindset, that these people need to be ruled. Their resources need to be managed by somebody else because they do not have the moral ability, you know, to do that themselves. Yeah, and the 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 way in which African countries, a lot of them, a lot, are still kept on the very close uh like supervision, like you must call it that, is is just mind-boggling for for then a continent that says colonialism is well over like like many, yeah. many, 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 many decades, yeah. right? Uh, like just 13 or 14 states in in uh, northern northwestern uh, africa still use the the french uh the french, french front, the cfr the yeah. cfr the cfr the yeah. uh, that the cfa cfa sorry i i i, I keep forgetting which is minted yeah. and produced in in france and then yeah. they are required to use this and whenever i mean this is a this is just a perfect means to 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 extract or to get all of the resources at a yeah fraction of the real price right a fraction yes. because you yes. you control the exchange rate and this is going yes. on as we speak and and macron and so on and the french still have the audacity yeah. to to pretend that they are there to help the yeah. the yeah. african continent that they're giving that they're giving aid this whole aid yeah. narrative is also outrageous yeah. isn't it it is, absolutely. Uh, let me draw your attention to something you said earlier. You said something about cognitive dissonance, by which I mean, I, I think you are referring to perhaps those in charge of the Euro-American establishment as being unaware of the paradoxes and the contradictions of what they say, what they claim they believe, and what they are doing. I think there's an extent to which that, that can explain the situation as a paradox, as a contradiction. Life, of course, we know is, is replete with paradoxes and, con and con um, contradictions. But I think we need to also understand, and it's a point I was trying to make during the conference, that the successes, the achievements, the dominance, the hegemony of the Euro Anglo American world in the past three, four centuries has not come without genocidal aggression. And so I believe that there are many leaders of that world, including people like Macron, for example, who are aware, definitely those in charge of the military industrial complex are aware that their dominance cannot be sustained because that dominance, you see, was achieved by genocidal aggression. So they have not learned any way of excellence. They don't have a record. They don't have a history to return to, to be dominant, to be on top of the world besides the genocidal um, um, aggression, which was handed over by the British empire to the current American empire. So whereas they talk about, you know, economy, do this, do your economy this way, do the interest rates this and that, uh, um, um, development is blah, 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 blah. They have to keep the military industrial complex going. They have to keep 800 military bases, which, which doesn't work alone for the U.S. in my estimation, but works for the entire 
Anglo-European, Anglo-American uh, uh, hegemony. Because um, they know that they didn't achieve what they achieved by convincing anyone. They achieved it by pointing a gun at people's heads. So they know the guns need to remain pointed at the heads of people if they must continue. So in, in that sense, there's no cognitive dissonance. They're just clever with the narratives, but, but they have to mask that from their populations, yeah. which maybe, maybe, maybe let me make this last point. I read somewhere, I can't remember now, that during the Spanish conquest of Mexico, right? And you know, these conquests, um, uh, the, the, they were contemporaneous with the spread of a certain form of Christianity in those parts of Europe, right? Uh, I, I read somewhere that when some of the Christians in Spain got reports of the horrendous, the violent nature of the conquest, they started challenging their leaders to say, but, but, but we are Christians, we are not supposed to kill people. And then the conquistadors say, no, these are not really people. We are trying to make them people. So these narratives are necessary to keep the actions that contradict the messages to make those messages align with the actions. They are absolutely necessary. So to that extent, for people like you and I, we can talk about cognitive dissonance, but I think there are some people there who actually know. I mean, how can Boris Johnson not know? I mean, we would be dehumanizing people like that if we say at that level, I can understand there are voters who may not understand, who may be looking out for just their personal comforts, I mean, in Europe and in America. Uh, but how can the people who foment wars, who spend gobs of money, not know that this is what they are doing? It's difficult for me to, to understand that. But true, true, true. Point. No, true. And, and at some point, at some level, some people must be aware of what the actual consequences of their of their um, political actions are. But at the same time, the system that you need, the machinery, the, so the social sociological machinery is so vast, is so big. And you have so many players in there, you know, the editors of newspapers and the yeah. moderators of of news shows and then the academics uh, in the universities who conceptualize all of this. And yeah. I don't think that all of them are like in cahoots, on, like saying, like, let's let's conspire to create a narrative. It's more that it kind of the way it tickles through the system. Them. It then creates something that, to the rest of the population who live in that, then make a world in which you are a champion of humanity while killing 10 million people uh, in the Congo, yeah. you know, um, yeah. as Belgium, like Belgium, yeah, Belgium, Belgium. Not, not, not even Britain or the Americans, but Belgium that, that did that under, and, and it's just, it just allows it to happen. Um, yeah. But in that this sense, the narrative is then essential for the violence yeah. to occur. Yeah, mm. that, that's absolutely essential. Um, um, Jeffrey Sachs, whom I respect uh, very, very, very well, I follow him. And of course, you know, he's also been ostracized from mainstream media in the US and in many parts of the world. He was speaking, uh, I think he was speaking to a bunch of students at Cambridge uh, I think this is less than two weeks ago. And he makes the interesting point that before the invasion of Iraq, focus groups were conducted to determine the ways in which that invasion, that invasion would be sold to the American public. <laughs> so I'm responding to what you said. Yes, at, at a level, we can say indeed... Um, these these people, they're not together. I mean, they don't have a single WhatsApp club, for instance. They don't have one meeting. But Emmanuel Wallerstein helps us understand how these things work in his very useful theory of systems, world systems theory, how systems come together. And I think it's also kind of inherent in human civilization. Systems are inherent in mm -hmm. humans, even in the animal world. So maybe intuitively, instinctively we as humans know how to work systems we don't really need a whatsapp group we know how who will speak with who 
and where it cascades to, and then it's it's like water finding its level. When water is at a high altitude, you don't need to point to water that here is a lower altitude flow. Water flows and it keeps flowing. A crack here, a crevice there, a slope here, a slant there, and it keeps going down. So I think, um, well, other theories have to do more on this for us, or maybe some have done and we've not read yet. But I do think in the sense of instinct and intuition, I do think they are in cahoots because people study places, people study systems. Uh, somebody who comes in today is going to say, okay, okay, this is what that person did. This is how he did it. These were the results. People read books, people follow history, and this is what I'm going to do. And sometimes as sure as weekend, they get the results. They get the results. So for instance, almost every little child knows that lies are powerful. And that's one problem many of us who, are, who have integrity have, I think. We so underestimate the power of lies. Mm. You know, people often say, oh, the truth will, the truth will, will come yeah. out. I don't think the truth comes out. But, but, isn't it, but isn't it fascinating that when you are able or when the system is able to impose a good narrative, and I mean a good narrative, not in yes. moral sense, I mean it as a, as a dominant narrative. Yes, the narrative, narrative is able to incorporate lies even those lies that come out as lies and the narrative doesn't yes. break i mean the 40 beheaded babies uh, yes. as an example yes. or like i mean on the african continent you will find like hundreds yes. hundreds of lies that didn't hurt the overall narrative despite the fact yes. that they came out how yes. does that yes. one work <laughs> yeah again it's so there's a, a piece of work i'm doing now it's what i'm going to present in a conference we're having here next week i presented it earlier I call it the coloniality of discourse. So narrative operates with language and a whole spectrum of signifiers and ways of signification, including intertextual links. So even if you talk of the event in Amsterdam a few days ago, mm. that is impossible without the prior discourses about people as victims yeah. and certain people as the stock perpetrators of violence. So narratives and discourses operate by working with each other. They work with allusion. So we came out of a situation in South Africa. We're still actually in that situation where, where certain characters are uh, portrayed as corrupt by certain characters. One set of the characters want to present themselves as, as neutral. And it's very interesting for me because it's the same thing that happened in Nigeria around about 2015. So the one contestant to political office portrays the other contestant as corrupt. All right. And you do it so much, you do it so often. Of course, you remember Hobel, so you, you, say the, you say a lie repeatedly, it assumes the status of truth in the mind of some people. And then you develop cues. You develop allusions. You develop oblique uh, 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 gestures. So in this particular case, if I am able to accuse Pascal repeatedly of being corrupt without evidence, I can now say those who are linked to Pascal, once I say this person is linked to Pascal, I have transferred the epithet of corruption to that person. And we do this transfer, we continue doing the transfer. So in yeah. the context of in, in the context of, of, of colonialism, for instance, it's been so powerfully done, the dehumanization of the non-European, especially the African, it's been done over so many centuries, so forcefully, that there are many who actually accept the status that has been conferred on them. So when 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 Macron comes in 2014 to say something in that regard, he is meeting very well-watered, fertile ground. He doesn't yeah. really need to push. Yeah. He, yeah. he doesn't need to push before he's, what he's saying is accepted. And, and you know, the stereotypes against um, Latinos in America, for instance, the stereotypes against Asians in America, for instance, 
these guys are building on watered ground, very fertile watered ground. And you mean uh, by and those to... groups, right? By those victimized groups, like the internalization of that discourse in those groups. Absolutely. All these lead to inter inter internalization. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard for you to come across Africans who haven't, to some extent, internalized the lies told about them over the centuries. It's not easy to come across Africans who are completely, in my personal experience, so I'm not generalizing this, in my personal experience, it's hard to find. One project I'm, I'm still doing now is how very many uh, Africans today in the age of social media um, repeat these damaging, dehumanizing stereotypes about themselves. Some, some use it as, as humor, but what kind of humor is that? It's something I'm finding difficult, but I'm, I'm studying the ways in which these stereotypes have been transferred and internalized. But, but where I think it's more damaging, although this is quite damaging, is how in the powerful, what they used to call the metropole, but let's still call it the metropole, these powerful centers in, in, in Europe and America, how some of these remain, uh, especially amongst those, I mean, people like Macron. Macron, for crying out loud, I think he's still under 50, isn't he? He's quite young. He's talking about carnivores. He is talking about carnivores in 2024, in spite of what has happened in Ukraine, in spite of what happened in many parts of the world. In 2024, somebody who is below 50 is still talking about why Europe needs to be an omnivore. Yeah. So you can see the primitive, the primitive nature, the barbarity, and the primordial, actually proto-human nature of these ideas that remain stuck in the imaginary of these people who say they rule the world. Yeah. And it's it's scary. No, it is scary. And I, I just need to come back to something that you that you said or analyzed just, just this moment ago, like that this connection between the overall narrative and the the what the signifiers and so on, and the fact that even you know that the mistake a lot some people make, well-meaning people like us, is yeah. that all we need to do is to unmask the lies. And then the truth will shine and the truth will enlighten everybody. And then yeah. and then we can move forward, right? And these lofty ideas of journal, uh, newspapers and so on, uh, uh, democracy dies in darkness and blah, 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 the, despite the fact that they don't believe that themselves. But the, the idea that we need the truth, but the truth yeah. isn't enough, isn't it? The truth doesn't actually kill the narrative. No, what, it doesn't. What can be done against these destructive narratives in narrative theory? Is it the, the construction of counter narratives or what what needs to be done to deal with narratives that cannot be killed by simply dismantling the lies that it is built on? That That's a very important question you've asked. I wish I have an answer or a simple answer, but it's something I've agonized over. And um, I will I will. I will draw on Chinua Achebe, the, uh, perhaps you heard of Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian um, writer. He says something very interesting. Let me try and paraphrase him. Um, he's growing up in the, before 1960. I try not to say pre-independence because I don't think African countries are independent yet. So he's growing up before flag independence. And I'm happy, you know this, um, uh, the Maltese foreign uh, minister we had in the conference who said something like, he said, mock independence. I took that from him. Yeah. So Achebe is growing up in this period and he reads two narratives. And this is a very interesting part of, of what needs to be done, if we can think of it in that way, this very powerful question you've asked. He reads, and take note that in literary studies are, are predominant or what we take as a fundamental point of departure is narratives usually fictional narratives, mm -hmm. uh, which many people don't take seriously, you know? So Achebe is reading this novel. I think there are two of them that impact him very strongly. There's one called, um, uh, uh, I think it's Mr. I, I, I wonder why I forget, but it's by Joyce Carey. The other, of course, is, uh, is um, the Polish writer's um, novel, Heart of Darkness where he has several scenes about indigenous Congolese people, where he describes them like beasts. Okay, so Achebe says something at a later stage in his career. 
One time he was asked, why doesn't he write about America? He was in America for a long time before he died. He said so many people are writing about America. But that the realization he came to as an undergraduate student, because he writes things for the past as an undergraduate student, which is massive. He's still in his 20s. He said he came to the realization that stories are not innocent. That stories are used to portray people in a negative way. So he realized, I'm trying to paraphrase him, that he has a duty. Because in those texts, he started seeing that these characters that are represented as beasts are characters like himself. So he said he decided to write stories mm. and put these stories out so they will mingle. He didn't use those words, but I think what he meant would help to push back on some of the uh, uh, negative stories that have been written about Africans. Chimamanda Adichie takes this forward. I think it's the same idea she takes forward when she talks about the danger of a single narr a single story. So where only one version of narrative is allowed to dominate, there is trouble. People believe those stories. And I think that's what you guys are doing. I think that's one of the major things we have to be thankful for alternative media. Because without alternative media, who would know what's really going on in, in Gaza? Who would know what's going on in, 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 in Ukraine and in Russia and in South Sudan and in all those places? So I think rather than wait for the story, for the truth to come out, the truth has to be told. Yeah. And alternative, I, I don't like the word alternative. I'll take that back. Other narratives have to be told. Because it gets to a point where I think people begin to pay attention. People begin to see the very obvious contradictions, the very obvious lies, like the Amsterdam situation. We would, I, to, but very importantly is the, let me talk first about the George Floyd situation. You remember George Floyd? Mm -hmm. We grew up, I grew up in Nigeria as a young person, hearing about how Black American men are irresponsible. How they don't like going to school. That's the stereotype we grew up with. Oh, America is such a beautiful country, but these Black guys, they are just not serious. They don't want to study. They just want to get a, a lady pregnant. They just want to do drugs. And if that girl wasn't had not videoed the murder of George Floyd, remember the police officers had lodged a report in the police station already before the story broke. They had to withdraw that because this other story dislodged the first story. So I think that's very important. And what happened in Amsterdam a few days ago, if people had not recorded it and put the stories out almost at the same time as the false versions were going on, what would people have to, to what recourse would, would we have to find out what the truth was? So I know I've not answered your question fully, but that is definitely something that needs to be done. But I think more importantly, we need to be aware about how narratives, how stereotypes, how cliches are generated, the purposes they serve, the ways they are circulated, and the effects they have. I think we also perhaps in a more intentional way, and that's what I hope I, 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 I should be able to do with, with what I do, let people know about that. Mm. I agree. I, uh, I agree to that. It's just a question also of practicability. Like, it's not just, it's not enough to just report on what is actually yeah. happening. It also needs to be reported again and again. You need to create a counter avalanche to that, to that avalanche of lies, right? Uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I wonder right now, it's a serious question, is like, can that be done by breaking up the complexity of what is happening and explaining it because one of the things is that a lot of the violence and a lot of these these uh, violent narratives that we are seeing rest upon a dumb version of reality it's a stupid version of what is happening right it's like and it's, it's often the black and white the good and the evil and so on and one part of me wants to do the opposite and say like no we need to we need to break that up and explain the complexity and bring complexity back that way that you you dismantle that that narrative on the other hand that might be the wrong strategy maybe the strategy has to has to be to give an, an a counter simple narrative but that 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 would 
has the capacity to supersede the destructive narrative. And I don't know which approach makes would make more sense, the comp the showing of the complexity or trying to create a counter simple narrative that can overlay the, the destructive one. What do you think about that? Again, very brilliant insights. Um, yes. Um, let me first comment on the DOM version. The DOM version is actually not DOM. It might be a version for dumb people. <laughs> so it's the version for, mo for, for, for morons. Um, oh, uh, that guy is the bad guy. We need to take him out. That guy is Hitler. We need to take him out. So that's the version. It's a simplified, I agree with you. It's a simplified, it's a dumb version. But it's not dumb in the sense that it took constructing. As Sachs said, for the, for the, for the um, Iraqi invasion, Actually, focus groups were held. These guys knew that we need to tell people. For instance, the American establishment now is trying to, some people in the American establishment from, establishment from the news that we hear, are trying to say why they should end the war in Ukraine and move on to China, for instance. <laughs> so, but that is not going to be sold in that way. It's going to be sold, we are peace-loving people, let's end the war. Then two weeks down the road, uh, another way is going to begin, you know, something like that. So it's not dumb in the sense that it has taken a lot of planning. But it's dumb, I agree with you, in the sense that it's the stupid version for those who are unwilling and maybe incapable or who have been lobotomized to the point that they don't apply their senses. They just take anything the politician says, anything the government says, anything the corporate media says. Yes, your question, your suggestions, I think both of them, a combination and perhaps more strategies have to come up. It's not a question that I think I can answer despite my the time I've put into, into narratives, but I do think, yes, a simply, people like simplified things, but the risk of providing a counter-simplified version is when that moron becomes, becomes um, sophisticated, they might associate you with the other side, with the same mm -hmm. people who produce a dumb uh, message. So I think fidelity to complexity is required but then there must be strategy. Uh, what I take, what, what I have reached, the conclusion I've reached, there must be strategy. What would constitute that strategy? In final details, I can't say I know for now. But then there must be counter narratives. There must be some fidelity to complexity. For strategic reasons, simplification may also be required as part of it. But a lot of effort is what people who support the truth often are unwilling to make. The effort that is made by the MIC to sell wars to hundreds of millions of people in Europe and America, they're doing it in Europe right now. Yeah, they're, they're convincing Europeans. And somebody asked me, somebody who is not an intellectual, when I make these arguments, that it's not really that the Europeans want war. The ordinary European, the common European does. He said, but then why don't they stand against their government? And it was difficult for me to respond. But one of the reasons is that the governments have given them a narrative that they've not taken time to understand, to break down. So counter narratives have to be told. I think alternative, again, I don't like the word alternative. New media has to be used. Uh, 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 strategy and effort and money has to mm -hmm. go into it. So I think people who do work like you do, it's incumbent on those who want the truth to support this kind of work. The, the thing is, you know, the most successful narratives, especially these pro-war narratives that I have been studying for, for a while now, what I realized is that they are so well constructed, they're so well done, that yes. the opposition to them, they are able to integrate them. You know, the, yes. the, 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 the trick is the following, that, okay, you have people who don't buy the narrative and they want to dismantle it. And then the narrative itself takes them over and says, these are the Putin lovers. These are the, <laughs> this is the enemy from within. So yes. anything they say is proof and testament to the veracity of their narrative. Of this Thereby, narrative, yeah. you, you lose the ability to provide a counter because the narrative yes. is able to incorporate the counter into itself and thereby create yes. the perfect harmonious system for itself. Yeah, but don't forget, I agree with you that uh, they are able to op to integrate, to co-opt the opposition. Uh, and to. But don't forget that the people who promote these narratives are extremely well-resourced. 
They have sure. deep pockets. And yes. they are very powerful. My sense, uh, I can't advance um, empirical um, evidence for this, is they force people, they succeed mostly by forcing people to buy these narratives. Take that lady who made the initial report on the Amsterdam inc incidents. It was too quick to persuade her. I don't think the time she revoiced the next video, I don't think she was persuaded. I think she was forced. And these people have the ability to force in academia. They have the ability to entice. They give fellowships, they give very generous, very generous support. They threaten, they threaten. The 800 military bases all over the world, that huge amount spent in intelligence, that the whole global surveillance system is not for nothing. They actually threaten, and I think that's where our, our worst fears are, because how many people are going to withstand that threat yeah. and remain committed to what they believe is truth? Especially people in the global north, people in Europe and America who have lived lives of convenience yes. all their lives, people who were born in wealth. Many of us Africans have faced a lot of adversity, so sometimes 50-50. Some of us have parents who were involved people who lost their lives who never enjoyed convenience because they were trying to affirm the, the the dignity of the humans but many of our european counterparts are not like that they've lived in affluence and convenience it is not easy to suddenly make these people stand by the truth so all they have to do for instance is to change a report is to reframe one report and then they, they, they might lose their jobs if they don't reframe the report or if they don't frame it in the way that you know the funder wants it framed. So we must also think of that. That's why I, I think solidarity and support, but an awakening, and people may not like this. This is also this kind of talk is also not very uh, popular among academics who claim to create a distance between themselves and, and integrity and, and morals and ethics. I think an ethical awakening is crucial. Yeah. The, an ethical awakening is very, very important. The, yeah. the, the thing is. And I still believe that people are fundamentally actually good. They want to be good to each other. Like there's that. There, yes, we have some rage and and whatnot and fears and 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 other other emotions. But fundamentally, we want to be fine with others. There's a tiny, tiny fraction of people who are psychopathic and a tiny fraction of people who are like pathologically sadist sadistic, but. The large majority isn't. So the question is more how the the system and narratives are an important part of that. How the system then then uh, enables this uh, this this these negative outcomes, right? That that impose yeah. large structural negative outcomes, including large spread death and destruction on 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 some groups of of humanity. Um, and I wonder then, you're absolutely right, the Europeans, the Euro-Americans, they are not accustomed to um, to hardship, uh, to real, like, long periods of hardship. But do you think that maybe the change that we are seeing now with also the empowerment of the Global South, and I remember you pointed that out in the, in your presentation as well, of the, 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 the share of global GDP, of the BRICS nations and so on, that maybe there's a chance here, like that the empowerment of these previously for hundreds of years structurally impoverished places yeah. might give us a chance to to construct a a a more cooperative future because it is it comes from places that had to endure so much. I do think so. I, I'm 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 a hope. Uh, they say hope springs eternal. I really hope that that would happen. I but I do think there's a chance. Uh, especially it's the it's the Portuguese um, philosopher who argued about 10 years ago, uh, Bonaventura de Sousa Santos, I think, I hope I got the name right, who spoke about the signs of exhaustion of Euro, Euro modernist uh, knowledge systems and power. The, the, that exhaustion, I believe, will lead to a paradigm shift. And events such as COVID um, events such as what's going on now, the wars, some of the wars going on now, uh, will force people to realize that the solid ground on which they have stood for a long time is now shaking. And when the ground on which you stand shakes, you do not need 
to be you don't need a sermon you don't need a to be convinced to move ground you move you move immediately where you are and um, so unfortunately it's not that one is hoping that things will go bad for a part of the world but where things do where things go bad people are forced to reconsider where they stand where what they used to trust uh, the actions they used to take the strategies they used to uh, employ and they got they were sure to get certain responses certain outcomes where those outcomes no longer where, where, where those acts no longer yield those desired actions i think people are forced to, to say and, and i think they will consider this absolutely like the shift of wealth the the decline in in the levels of comfort that people experience in certain, certain parts of the global north um i think that will force them and of course the climate issues as well look at the floods in in in, in malaga in the past few days um uh, i think it will cost it should hopefully cause people to move. But I, I don't know how, whether I would agree with you entirely that the majority of people, well, if you are speaking of people, yeah, maybe, but if we are speaking of people who hold power, mm. I do think to some extent those are, they might be a different, that might be a different kettle of fish because power has a way of attracting a certain kind of people. And that's one of the biggest problems with democracy, the way it's practiced. I don't know whether this happens to you. Let me just ask you. Um, let's say among your circle of friends, right? You want to do something informal and you need somebody to do something. In my experience and in my cultural experience, it is often not the most capable. The most capable does not often uh, uh, volunteer to do what they are best what they they, 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 they they can do for a group. I don't know whether that happens to you. This is anecdotal, but it may have some sense. Uh, people usually who, are, who can maybe keep money for a group, help the group, they usually ask, they, we usually say, Pascal, Pascal, you are best at this, please do it for us. And you do it. But the democratic system the current democratic, the bourgeois democratic system is the one in which the absolute rogue amongst all of us is the one who is conversing to be treasurer of the group. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, I mean, so we have those people seeking power. Yeah. And you can you can look at the way that the, the political systems, I mean, in the US and in, in Europe, what kind of characters they produce. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, I I I I um I have nothing nothing to put against that. They, yeah. These are not the most capable of people. I but mean, they are the ones who make it to the top. Yeah, they are, they are. So that's why I'm a bit skeptical about, about your thesis that we have most people good. Um, maybe they, in the general human population, but because at the end of the day, these are the guys who take decisions. Is this true, people true, who true. force their ways to the front? That they, they, they literally force their ways to the front. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. No, and but um, they do so in a system in which they don't necessarily need to see the people who who they push aside and and the misery that they cause. Right, a a, bar, a large part of of the structural violence is perpetrated by people who don't have to actually pull the trigger. Right, that you create something that creates a system so that even even Hitler, when he went home, he probably kissed his. His girlfriend, his wife, and he had his dog, yeah. and, and probably he yeah. gave people food at his table. You know, yeah. like even even the worst of the worst, like in in yeah. inter interpersonal relations, most people then behave uh, 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 well with others. Um, but then the systems we make and the narratives that we create around them um, create the structural violence. Yeah. Yeah, I, I take um, it. Agogo, uh, I mean, we are reaching the one hour mark, and uh, I really enjoyed this. We didn't even get to talk about African foreign politics at all, but I found this oh, fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll we'll do so again, and uh, if people want to find your work, uh, where should they follow you, find you, read about you, and your analysis? I'm not so much of a social media person these days, but uh, you know, academics. I'm sure you have an ORCID. Uh, number, uh, uh, Google Scholar, uh, yeah, and maybe just uh, if somebody's as interested, just Google the name. I'm currently an associate professor in the Department of English in Zululand. It's not your uh, very well-known and very attractive place, but I like it here. 
but yeah, and then we do get about and uh, meet in these conferences and and um, and programs. So yeah, so maybe for now. But I do intend. I do have a profile on LinkedIn, but it's not updated at all. But I will put I will put your orchid number down into the uh, to the description so people can find your academic writing um, that is linked to that one. And then uh, I'll just ha we'll have you on the channel again and talk um, maybe more things Africa next time. But thank you very much. Oh, yes. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal.